Hello everybody, Jonathan here. One of the great things about this series in particular is I get to occasionally walk up and down the, the racks and the drawers and the shelves and just see what there is and what might be good to show you guys for uh, one of our episodes. Smell the roses, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> and this is, as soon as I saw this one, which wasn't immediately obvious from the way that we store our um, AR-15 type weapons, uh, and rifles in general, which is facing away from you, is this monstrosity. So uh, the first thing I noticed and had seen a, seen a few times actually was this bright pink paint on the muzzle device, which, which is weird. Uh, and I'm afraid I can't explain. Uh, we, we purchased this from a dealer some years back and I don't know why the previous owner painted it neon pink. So ignore that for the moment. Um, <laughs> but that's what attracted me to it, thinking, is that a toy or an airsoft gun or something? Took it off the rack and laughed out loud because <laughs> this, well, have you already guessed what it is? Let me take it off and show you the magazine. Very characteristic rib or, or negative um, uh, uh, pressing on the back there, the witness holes, the floor plate, slight taper, even the, um, just faintly, the off and an arrow showing you the direction to take the base plate off when you disassemble the magazine. The infamously sometimes problematic feed lips. This is a Sten magazine. So this is an AR-15 <laughs> pattern rifle with a Sten magazine in it. So I had to, of course, get to the bottom of why that is. Some of you, especially in the States, might already know. So this magazine, while we're, while we're on it, um, has had tack welded to it, this a reinforcement in here that makes the, this portion of it very thick, um, but the sides are just thin sheet steel. And there is an added on cutout here. Now that, as you probably gathered, lines up with the equivalent cutout on an AR-15 magazine. So it's been, the mag has been made deeper in order to fit the magazine well, equivalent to, to the AR mag, and it's had a cutout so that the magazine catch can engage and keep it in place. So why would you convert a, an infamously not always very reliable British submachine gun mag magazine, nine by 19 millimeters of course, from the Second World War era to an AR-15. You might be minded to try and insert an AR-15 magazine into this, but it doesn't go. It will go in, but it won't latch in place. And there's a good reason for that, which you will see shortly. Uh, now, obviously, it wouldn't be a good idea because as some of you will have surmised, converting a 5.56 millimeter uh, self-loading rifle, in this case, to 9mm is not as simple as adapting the magazine to the magazine well. Um, that you know, different, different cartridge case dimensions, uh, you, you need a, a 9mm chambered barrel of course. You probably don't want to be using your stoner gas system, you probably want to turn it into a blowback operated system. Uh, now Colt came up with their own 9mm, well not conversion, but factory made 9mm carbines. Um, before this was even a thing. So this, this is mid 80s to mid 90s in manufacture. Ours I think is early 90s in, in, in manufacture. And before we pop it open and have a look at what they have done to make this run nine mil rounds, let's just cover off what, uh, who this, who this, who, who made this thing? <laughs> so this is an Olympic arms rifle and their markings and address are there on the, on the lower receiver and their logo is uh, there's, a, there's a further roll mark with caliber model and serial number as is tradition with the Olympic arms logo on the lower receiver further forward so M the MFR is not the 9mm Olympic arms rifle the MFR was their standard series of AR-15 type rifles so this is this is pseudo A2 um, A2 type buttstock, pistol grip, forward assist, case deflector, handguard, barrel profile. Not the muzzle device, funnily enough, that's an A1. 
and the carry handle sights are A1 as well, but then there are plenty of Colt A2 pattern rifles that, were, that also had those features. So you could easily get this rifle in, in 5.56. This one was, seems to have been delivered, or, well, almost certainly was delivered in 9mm, pre-converted, because um, some people wanted that. I'm just going to interrupt myself there, just to make a, a small brief plea. Um, like a lot of channels, we notice that a lot of people who watch and hopefully enjoy our content do not or are not currently subscribed to the channel. It really does help us out if you not only like the video, but subscribe to the channel. And if you like what you're seeing here, you're sure to like what we're going to do next week and for the foreseeable future. So let's pop this open and have a look because on the outside, there's really not much to see. If you look um, in the front of the handguard there, you will see there is no gas tube. So we know that this is not going to be gas operated. Uh, we'll pop open the receiver as normal. Uh, before we go any further, there is no change to the lower receiver. Trigger group is the same, hold open, mag catch. It's the magazine that's, that's altered, not the mag well. That is an important selling point in theory of this in that most cartridge conversion systems adapt the magazine well with a sort of shim um, adapter device, which means you're changing the rifle. This, you change the magazine. But since you have to change the upper receiver con contents anyway, I'm not sure how much of an advantage that is. Uh, the buffer setup is the same. Uh, I, I won't pop that out. I don't know if they've changed the weight of the buffer for this. So right away, I pop this bolt carrier group out. A real AR-15 bolt carrier, or M16 in fact, um, bolt carrier that has been machined out, skeletonized essentially, to get the, the mass right. They've left the gas key on the top there, interestingly. They have replaced or inserted a new bolt face, a tapered bolt face with the correct dimensions for 9x19 cartridges. There's a, an extractor there, so it, it's, they've, they've lost the standard extractor eject, uh, plunger eject, uh, ejector of the, of the AR. It does still have a, an extractor here, sprung, and there's a, a trough cut here for an affixed ejector or semi-fixed ejector, which is the one bit of this that I find quite questionable. <laughs> so what do I mean? Well, we can see up inside the upper receiver here, there's this cross pin with what looks to be a spring. And it sort of is a spring, but it's a, just basically just the, the end of a spring that comes riding down that channel on the bolt and kicks the cartridge case out. So the extractor claw pulls the case rim back, and just like a lot of other designs, or well, SMG type designs, a fixed ejector comes popping out of that channel and kicks the case rim out. So it's like a twisting effect. That's why, that's why cartridge cases spin out of uh, ejection openings. Normally a fixed ejector is like a blade, like quite a robust, at least a bit of stamped metal that's bent and hardened. So that, that really doesn't inspire confidence in me. And it's this that's stopping your AR-15 magazine from sliding in and locking into place. I'll show you what I mean. That locks in just fine. Uh, but if we try to close it, that cross pin with the spring wound around it, that's as far as it will go. So it's a little bit jerry-rigged to replace the plunger ejector that's on the face of the AR-15 AR bolt with a cheap and slightly concerning in terms of how robust it is fixed ejector that is essentially a piece of spring now it is it's sprung which means it sort of scrapes along that channel in the bolt that i've described uh, which probably helps with with well, sort of helps with functioning but i, I don't know i'm not <laughs> not really convinced by that um, i don't know how good and reliable these are um if, if, if anyone at home has uh, a, con a conversion of this nature please do let us know how well it functioned. Um, I think this, for me, we'll just get this back. We'll just get this back together because that's as much interest as there is on the inside. So 
So there's, yeah, we feature a lot of sort of dead ends and curios on this series for obvious reasons. We want we want you to guess what the thing is ideally before you watch the video. Um, this does have some relevance though because it's a sort of early foreshadowing of the modern day pistol caliber carbine phenomenon. Uh, so today, very popular, um, probably more so in the US than anywhere else, are pistol caliber, so 9mm, 45, 40, 10mm, versions of arms that were originally designed for rifle caliber cartridges, especially the AR-15. And probably the first popular one of those was the Colt, SMG, but that was not immediately available in a, in a civilian legal form. So Olympic Arms steps in in the, in the mid, mid 80s. Uh, there'll be others out there, but the Olympic Arms seems to have been somewhat popular. And you could also get this conversion system uh, mag, I believe it's called the Han system, H A H N. So you could buy this conversion system with that bolt and a supply of these magazines and in theory convert your own rifle uh, more than anything i was just stunned that anyone would select the the St the infamous sten magazine to convert an otherwise perfectly serviceable ar-15 into a potentially lot uh, far less serviceable nine millimeter carbine but sten magazines especially in the 80s and 90s uh, were plentiful and relatively cheap and no one cared about welding bits of metal onto the back of them uh, to make them function which, which will save you money in the long run. So the, apart from fashion, the main reason to have a uh, pistol caliber version of something that's designed for a, for a more powerful cartridge is the cost of ammunition. It's far cheaper to run things on pistol ammunition. Uh, some people just enjoy them as a fun thing to shoot. They don't really help with felt recoil because the, the perceived recoil of the 5.56 cartridge really isn't massively different to most pistol calibers. Uh, so subjectively, the feeling of shooting a, an AR-15 pattern rifle or, or any other 5.56 rifle is, you know, there's not much to choose between. So you don't, you don't go this route for low recoil. Uh, you also don't go this route for lethality because pistol caliber rounds are de facto, by default, less capable of penetrating any sort of body armor. And they're gonna do less damage to, to human tissue than uh, a 3000 feet per second, 77 grain projectile. So not for the, the only two reasons are because they're cool and fun and because they save you money at the range. Uh, now, obviously this is just one part of the Olympic arms story. They are, I believe, defunct now. Um, they were on the sort of lower price end of the market, I gather. The guy in charge of the firm, Bruce Bell, uh, he, there was some, some interesting press interviews with him where he talks about um, dealing with the market following the 1994 assault weapons ban in the United States. So-called assault weapons ban, as we've, I think, mentioned before in this very series, assault weapon nearly always doesn't mean anything, but regardless, there was a ban on certain features of semi-automatic rifles in the United States that no longer applies other than some states, but it did in, apply across the country in 1994. And Mr. Bell decided to introduce uh, a version of this rifle with the bayonet lug ground off, no thread on the on the muzzle end so that you couldn't change the, the flash hider, flash suppressor. Um, if it had a collapsing stock, telescoping stock, that was pinned in place so it couldn't, couldn't slide. And they came with only five or 10 round magazines. Now, all of these were features of this, of this ban. And he dubbed the new rifle the PCR, standing for Politically Correct Rifle. It's a bit of a dig at the authorities. He states himself that retrospectively, he renamed the MFR the mother <laughs> rifle. <clears throat> As in, this is the real rifle. You know, I don't know, like um, the non-compromised uh, form of the PCR. And they went, they carried on uh, for sale. Like if you, if you were law enforcement or something, I guess you could buy the, the um, MFR and otherwise you were stuck with the PCR. So a little, um, little bit of a side story there, but it's part of the Olympic arms story. So this is, uh, the name of this kind of depends on the era. <laughs> Thanks for watching guys. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, as always, do check out our, our website, our social media outlets that we, that we have, our three uh, physical museums, of course, if you're in the UK at any point. Speaking of which, we do have a, a new exhibition that's just opening called Reloaded. Um, lots of mainly decorated 
firearms, some, some pretty fascinating stuff in there. Uh, Gold-plated Kalashnikov, uh, beautiful uh, Art Deco baby browning pistol, uh, all sorts of things for you to check out there. Please do come and see that.